Uh, Mayor Stephanie Miner from the great state, excuse me, great city, and it should be a state of Syracuse. Thank you, Senator DeFrancisco. I think that we could probably have everyone here agree that uh, Syracuse is located in the great state of New York. It'd be a, a great way to start a bipartisan discussion about Syracuse and the state of New York. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank Senator DeFrancisco and Assemblyman Farrell. Uh, the committee chairs for holding this hearing, as well as the ranking minority members of the committees, Assemblyman Oaks uh, and Senator Liz Kruger, and for uh, all of the other members of the Assembly and Senate who are here today to listen to me speak. In the hopes of being succinct and getting to the issues that uh, you would like to talk about, I am not going to repeat a lot of the testimony that you heard my fellow mayors speak about. Uh, I am honored uh, to be considered and put in the same category uh, as Mayor Bloomberg, who is a consummate problem solver, uh, as Mayor Richards, who very eloquently and elegantly describes the problem that faces cities. And of course, uh, Mayor Spano as well, who uh, has the added benefit of knowing how to speak to members of the state legislature. And many of the issues that they spoke to you about, I share their concern from the broken modeling, the broken financing models for cities, uh, as well as uh, thanking the governor for issues like the historic tax credit um, and also s talking about how a sales tax exemption for IDAs would impact the city of Syracuse. Um, let me just start by saying that the, the city of Syracuse is the smallest of the so-called Big Five of New York State. And it is the anchor of the central New York region, which stretches from Lake Ontario to Pennsylvania. And while we, similar to Rochester, are the anchor of our region, we have been very fortunate in recent years that, unlike most other upstate cities, our population has stabilized. We are a city on the move, and we have had record numbers of construction permits issued and cranes in the air, and there is a signal of strong economic development going on. And in fact, since 2009, our continued economic growth has almost doubled. And 2012 was a record year with construction values more than doubling since uh, 2009. A number of these projects in Syracuse and in Central New York have been made possible thanks by awards from the Regional Economic Development Council process. And I want to thank all of you for supporting that process and, of course, thank the governor for instituting it and putting his full support behind it. We have been successful in bringing home more than $197 million for central New York, including more than $59 million for projects in the city of Syracuse. We were very fortunate due to the hard work of a number of central New Yorkers and Syracusans to distinguish ourselves as one of the four best plan awardees and receive the most money out of any region in the state. And one of the reasons that we believe we were so successful um, and was we were commended for our community revitalizing strategy as well as our region's ability to talk about a unified vision and what's important to our community to move forward in the areas of economic development. And while Syracuse and Central New York share a unified vision, uh, Syracuse, as the anchor of that region, is a hub. We are the center of innovation. We have a tremendous workforce and intellectual capital in clean energy, health care, and higher education fields. And we have recently received na national recognition for the exciting work and innovation taking place in Syracuse. Syracuse was the only city in New York State to be designated as one of uh, the prestigious IBM Smarter Cities. The uh, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency chose Syracuse as one of the 10 cities nationwide to be recognized as a, quote, green infrastructure partner based on our success in implementing green techniques along with Onondaga County and our county executive to implement and manage stormwater and in, our, in the process create a more sustainable, livable community. The U.S. Green Buildings Council awarded the county executive, uh, who you will also hear from, and the Syracuse University Chancellor and myself its Global Community Leadership Award for our collective commitment to greening the Syracuse community. These are but a few of the awards and recognition that we find ourselves receiving from third-party outside entities, recognizing what is possible in an innovative government when you have collaboration. 
But unfortunately, like all governments, we find ourselves in the midst of a fiscal crisis. It is a sign of the times that we live in. Unlike all other governments, we, though, bear the direct responsibility for providing vital services on which our residents, our workers, and visitors rely every day. Of course, police and fire protection, safe water, trash removal, and a personal favorite of mine, snow removal. They are the obligatory functions of any healthy city and community. And frankly, all of the transformative economic development that we have done and we hope to continue to do in the future will fundamentally wither away should the city be forced to discontinue the delivery of these services. As uh, Mayor Spano aptly quoted the governor, stating, it, it, in the body of the state, the cities are the organs. So there is no future for a state where your cities are going bankrupt. The health of the cities is vitally important. And I think you take any city, generically, you want to attack both fronts. You want to increase revenues and you want to reduce costs. And as a city, we are doing our part to both cut costs and boost revenues. We have tightened our belt. We have consolidated services. We have pressured tax-exempt organizations to provide us revenues and enter into service agreements with us. We have negotiated zeros with our unions. We have increased health care costs on our management confidential employees. We have cut overtime. We have our employment is 10 percent down from where it was in December of 2009. We are and continue to do everything that we can to be more efficient and more effective in delivering services. However, the city has non-controllable expenses that cripple our ability to save ourselves from what appears to be impending insolvency. Employee costs have skyrocketed and comprise 72 percent of our overall expenses. Out of city employees, police and fire make up 67 percent of the city's overall costs. Police and fire wages have grown by 39 percent between 2000, the fiscal year 2000-2001 and the fiscal year 2010 and 11 where in comparison, all other city wages only grew by 22 percent. The greater increase, we believe, for police and fire is, of course, due to the benefit of having their wages negotiated by an arbitrator. And I'd like to commend the governor for his proposal in the budget to cap arbitration awards. This will help alleviate some of the stress and force real bargaining where before there has only been an attempt and perhaps not a very meaningful attempt. Just as an example, the Taylor Law was amended in 1975 and uh, 1976. And up until January of 2006, our Police Benevolent Association had gone to interest arbitration 13 times out of a possible 16 awards or negotiations. And the PBA has, in, in the one of those times that they did not arbitrate, uh, received a 5% increase, due in large part to what the, I'm told the management of the city felt was uh, the best that they could do given those, the arbitration awards. And I uh, want to echo the comments of Mayor Bloomberg this morning who said it's a good idea and it should go even further um, and that this is going to help make recalcitrant unions come to the table and negotiate. But. Pensions are by far the biggest uncontrollable cost that the city of Syracuse is challenged with paying. And the pension system is a New York state benefit. Pensions are state controlled, they are state run, and they are state authorized fund. Local governments simply receive a bill. Your decisions dictate vesting, retirement eligibility, benefits, and employee contributions. This is not a case where local Syracuse officials made bad decisions and we are now looking to you to help us rectify the results of those decisions. And I was here earlier when, uh, when it was proposed that perhaps adding over time and uh, the size of employments and salaries are indeed driving pension costs. And I can tell you that 70 percent of our pension costs are composed by police and fire costs. And as I just mentioned, our police and fire go to binding interest arbitration, which is a decision that is awarded to us. 
So these are not, in Syracuse's cases, decisions where we gave up the store. But these were decisions that were nevertheless made by well-meaning people, people in all of our positions, who wanted to do right by their employees and also understood the importance a pension system has and a pension is in employees' lives. But the decisions that were made regarding those pension benefits have put all of us in the eye of a fiscal storm. And I don't think that you can turn to us as mayors and say that this is solely your responsibility. Tighten your belt and figure out how to resolve the inequity. That is simply not the way or not possible for us to manage ourselves out of this problem. As an example, I think that we should look at the year 2000. That year, the state legislature unanimously voted to end employee contributions after 10 years of service, authorize annual cost of living increases, and enhance provisions for early retirement. And in fact, between 2000 and 2009, the legislature enacted dozens of individual laws enhancing pension benefits. As a comparison, I'd like to talk about the city of Syracuse pension costs for the same time period. From 2000 to 2010, Syracuse had a 729% increase in pension costs. This actual cost of pensions in the fiscal year 2000 to 2001 was $2.4 million, and it jumped to $19.9 million in fiscal year 2010-2011 and it has increased exponentially every year since. Fiscal year 2011, it was 23.5 million, an 879% increase since 2000. Fiscal year 2012, it was 27.9 million, which is a 1,062% increase. And in fiscal year 2013, we are projected, and projected by the Comptroller's Office, to have a $32.5 million pension bill. Now, obviously, poor market conditions were a driver of these costs. But these decisions that were made in 2000 have implicated and have made the bills that we have to pay be that much higher. Now, the state has also helped chip away at this issue. And I want to thank you and the governor for last year giving the city of Syracuse a $20.9 million one-time only spin-up aid. We use that money exclusively to pay our pension bills. And you also at the, uh, enacted Tier 6 to offer long-term savings. And I want to thank the governor and all of you as well for giving us that opportunity. But today we find ourselves in the midst of the testimony that you've heard and the discussion as a country about where we are and how we're going to afford pensions. And the governor, in his budget, proposed a stable rate pension contribution offer that would reduce near-term payments for the city of Syracuse, but would require higher than normal contributions in the latter years. If enacted, as proposed, Syracuse would have the option to immediately reduce pension contribution rates by locking in a stable pension rate for a 25-year period and requiring higher contributions in the latter years. While I am clearly eager to accept any opportunity to provide immediately relief of our pension costs, I have the responsibility as the mayor of Syracuse to also act in the best interest of the future fiscal condition of the city of Syracuse. And in doing so, I said at the time that this budget proposal came out that I had more questions than answers. And that still exists today. My administration and I will prudently examine the governor's plan in conjunction with our own budget projections and also the other information that will be provided to determine whether this option will offer a long-term solution or simply defer the crisis for someone in my position to mitigate in the future. And let me just pause here and say that if you look at the pension contribution offer and the proposal that has been made, the sort of day of reckoning, if you will, is five years from now. Um, if I am fortunate enough to be reelected as mayor of the city of Syracuse, I will not be mayor in five years. So perhaps the easiest thing for me to do would have been to say that this proposal uh, on its face 
is a fantastic proposal, knowing full well that in five years I will not be in the seat looking directly at how to pay for it. But that is not what I think our responsibility is, and those of us who sit in elected positions today understand all too well what happens when you have people who have made short-term decisions that have long-term detrimental results. So before authorizing this program in the budget, I believe that there are questions that need to be answered and should be asked, and issues that need to be investigated. How do we know that this plan is viable 25 years down the line? Reviewing an actuarial report from an independent analysis analyst would be helpful to municipalities in deciding whether or not to opt in. Published materials such as this could speak to the stability of the fund in the long term. It appears that the plan hinges on a high turnover rate of current employees being replaced by ones entering Tier 6. That is not our experience in Syracuse. Overall, employees are staying in the system longer and retiring later. And in fact, it is our experience that public safety employees are not retiring after 20 years of service. In Syracuse, the higher the rank of the firefighter or police officer, the longer they stay in the system at the higher contribution rate. Moreover, we are already looking to trim an already lean workforce and review every position and fill it or not fill it where we can. This program is based on the idea that we could reap long-term savings of Tier 6, but it may turn out that the rate of new employees coming into the system at Tier 6 may not be fast enough to make the program effective. The city of Syracuse, as an example, has only hired 24 replacement employees since the enactment of Tier 6, which will save the city of Syracuse $38,000, and clearly this provides some relief. But as I started off talking about our cost-saving measures, we are already down 10 percent, and we will, in the near future, have to go down even further. If this plan is based on a one-for-one -one replacement or perhaps a two-to-one replacement, we need to understand the implications of that. Will we end up saving money if we defer these payments to a later time? According to this proposal, the plan would save the city of Syracuse $43.5 million over a five-year period, which obviously uh, would certainly help the immediate problem of funding these costs. But what about when it's finally time to pay them? Without carefully vetted projections, we can only speculate. The near-term savings are calculated on events in the future that may not occur. And I am concerned that in the first five years of this plan, we may actually just simply be financing another liability that we will not be able to pay. The proposal has implications that will have a long-term and lasting impact. I fear that opting into this program could be a hasty solution for cities to fix an immediate cash flow needs. And as you heard my colleagues speak about, we are all deeply concerned about the broken financing model behind cities. Moreover, volatility in the marketplace, as we have all learned after 2008, and the changing economic conditions have a way of altering the best laid plans. Should challenging economic conditions present themselves in the future and cities are unable to pay this liability, the New York State retirement system could be seriously at risk. I ask you to think of this. If the legislature knew today what would happen in 2008, do you think they would have suspended employee contributions as they did in the year 2000 for Tier 3 and 4 employees? Finally, is there a definitive end to this program? The plan proposes that at various intervals it will be reevaluated, and if the return on investment in the retirement fund does not meet expectations, they will just lengthen the term of the plan. A 25-year plan could potentially turn into 30, maybe a 40-year plan, and the taxpayers are always responsible for funding it. The municipalities that have already availed themselves of the current pension amortization plan have a growing debt, and if they opt into this program, it will grow larger. In fiscal year 2011, 57 municipalities took advantage of the pension amortization plan offered by the Comptroller. 
and financed $43.5 million of their pension costs. Just one year later, it had ballooned to 165 municipalities in the amount of $206 million. We, as office holders, have an obligation to do what is prudent, and these decisions will impact us regardless of our current positions. It requires a close examination of any proposal that may be enticing in the short term, but shackle our future. And after all, as I said to you, I know in five years, in the best of cases, I will not be mayor of Syracuse. That does not in any way bar that I will always want the best for my fellow citizens and the city of Syracuse. Syracuse will always be a part of me, and I, of course, will always be a proud New Yorker. I ask that as we navigate these difficult times ahead, we create solutions rather than simply defer problems for our successors. Thank you for your time and your consideration, and I would welcome your questions. Thank you very much, Mayor. Questions? Mr. Mayor, Mayor Morales. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hello, uh, Madam Mayor. How are you? I'm well, Assemblyman Magnarelli. Um, you know, I, I, I'm listening to this, and it's uh, confusing. Okay, because on one hand, we have the mayors, all, well, four mayors, all concerned about how they're going to meet their obligations. And the governor has put forth something that's going to save the city of Syracuse, I think in his estimate, estimates that we've seen about $12 million next year on this pension proposal. Um, and yet you're concerned about it and, and troubled. You know, my question, I guess, it, it, I'm just giving an opinion here, that it would seem to me that we're going to be able to get this vetted before it comes to a vote. Uh, I would hope that, you know, uh, the Comptroller's Office, rating institutions, et cetera, would be taking a look at this and giving um, everybody that's sitting up here a better idea of what this means going down the road. Um, but I do understand what you're saying, but I, I do have a question in my mind. Basically, what else is there that you would suggest? Basically, you're coming to the state and saying what? And I've asked the same question to Mayor Richards and Mayor Spano. I mean, we're basically asking all the same. What idea do you have in mind? What are you looking for the state to do outside of what Mayor Richards has already said, which is, you know, we need to change this and basically fund it with the state income tax instead of property taxes. Well, I heard Mayor Richards, and, and I don't think that's exactly how he answered it. Um, well, but I, I will not speak for Mayor Richards. Okay. Let me answer your query uh, by saying welcome to our world in terms of there are no easy answers. But also, let me say that this proposal, if after a full vetting in the um, legislature and the governor and the comptroller and the teacher's retirement system deem it to be an appropriate risk, is not a panacea for cities. This is not going to keep cities from facing financial instability, bankruptcy, insolvency, however you want to say it. It may extend the term but it's not going to solve the problem. And I think you heard Mayor Richard very eloquently speak to the fundamentals that finance cities established in the 18th century, I believe he said, um, have changed. And so what we need to have is a serious discussion of policyholders at all levels of government. There are a lot of different things that need to change and be implemented. So do I wish I, I had one answer for you? Absolutely. I wish that we in the city of Syracuse could do it ourselves, but we can't. Um, just as you in New York State cannot do it alone either. But we all need to meet together and to have serious policy discussions and move forward to try to solve all these problems. And I would, I would say almost independent of this proposal, but clearly this proposal um, has captured the attention and I think merits a full vetting and discussion. Well, I, I you know, I, I hope I, I, I guess I was a little unclear, but um, 
I wasn't talking about a city income tax. I was talking about taxes collected by the state that eventually get paid or as uh, aid to municipalities or whatever. I'm trying to figure out what are you asking for? Well, uh, b besides, if this isn't good enough, if proposals like this are not good enough, then my question is, what are the municipalities asking us to do? I think you have to look at, and what we're saying, which is why we've been meeting and why we've been talking, um, that we have to look at everything. We have to look at the rules and regulations that govern how we, uh, our employee-employer relationship and collective bargaining, which has clearly been done and a good step forward with the binding interest proposal that has been put forward. In the city of Syracuse, 50 percent of our property is non-taxable. Um, and we have and have been led a charge to negotiate service agreements with our largest nonprofits. And we've been successful uh, thanks to the leadership of um, both Syracuse University and Krauss Hospital. Uh, but the largest nonprofit in the city of Syracuse and the largest employer is the SUNY Upstate Hospital System. They are also, by the way, um, growing and they are terrific jobs and they're the kind of jobs that we want to have. They're livable wages, high skills, it's exactly what we want to have. But as those jobs grow, they expect and should have, if there's a fire, there's going to be a fire department that puts it out. That the road is going to be both plowed in the winter and paved in the summer. That the trash is going to be picked up when they turn on the water, there's going to be a clean water system. And as you as you take what little disposable income we have as a city, we're putting it all towards pensions. And we have reached the point where we are going to have to cut back those valuable services in order to pay for pensions. And so before we get to a point where we have real hardships on the people of Syracuse or Rochester or Yonkers, I would ask you to remember we are all New Yorkers. And we all want to have jobs and economic development but unless we roll up our sleeves and look at these fundamental trends and understand the importance of these services and the fact that cities are delivering them uh, and that we have to be able to pay for them, we won't be able to have meaningful economic development. But you're not, asked, you're not insinuating that the pension shouldn't be paid? No, not at all. Okay. Of course what not. You're, what you're saying is, is that we just have to come up with the money to fund the services that the cities are providing. And help us sh okay. share in solving the, the pension issue. I don't know if I can ask. I've got three other questions that go to the specifics of the budget. You want me to go ahead? OK. Um, the speeding ticket and the surcharge thing, is that anything that the city of Syracuse has a concern about? Not right now, no. OK. And I know I asked you this before in Syracuse at my committee hearing, but consolidation and merger grants and all of the different programs that have been in the budget the last two years, I know that the city and the county have done everything they can, but do you see that as anything that is a great advantage to the city this year? The, the county executive and I have um, made great forward progress in consolidation. Um, and we will continue to do it where it makes sense and where we think we can uh, implement that. Um, but the issues that plague the city of Syracuse are of the kind of proportion of pensions and salaries and providing services and the consolidation grants that you speak of just don't rise to a level where they, they not are make a dent. alleviating those concerns. Okay. Mayor, thank you very much. Thank you, Assemblyman. Thank you, Mayor Miner. You know, when I, I listened carefully to your testimony and I had heard some of your comments before about your concern about the pension um, flattening proposal. And it reminded me of that I've always voted against the pension amortization proposals here. And actually back in 2010 had a committee that did a report on concerns about it. And I share your concern that there's not enough details yet to analyze what the, what the impact could be years down the road. And I think it's very important um, to just, again, put, repeat on the record. Yes, it may save your city and other localities X amount of money, 
over the next five years based on the projections we've seen, it doesn't forgive you those obligations. Somewhere down the line, that money has to be in the system to pay out the pensions. And if we look at the patterns from amortization models, which are different from around the country, um, we see that you have variations of greater obligations than you ever would have imagined in certain years um, to situations in a couple of states where technically they're in violation of their constitution and even on the verge of bankruptcy in their pension system. So I, like you, am very, very hesitant to support <laughs> proposals that make it go away for now. But if you look at the math over a long enough trend line, might blow up in all of somebody else's faces. So I really appreciate your pointing that out. Um, I also, as you might have heard, was asking the mayor from Rochester what alternative models of tax policy actually could make sense for um, upstate cities that perhaps don't have exactly the same suburban urban scenario that my own in New York City does. I asked him whether he thought about um, an income tax to um, basically have people who work in his city but don't live there pay towards the services of the city because, of course, people commute into cities to work and businesses operate in cities um, because of those services that they can take advantage of. Mm -hmm. And he, rightly so, I think, raised that it's not like that for Rochester. And I'm just curious, do you see that as an alternative option for Syracuse? Uh, I do not for the much the same reasons that Mayor Richards also stated. It's easy to get out of downtown Syracuse um, and people will say, you know, that the cost structure will make it cheaper um, and we all live in a free market society to go to the, to the suburbs. That being said, you, this, as I've stated, the city of Syracuse is 50% of our properties are non-taxable. And they also happen to be where most of our economic growth is coming from, our, the so-called eds and meds. So they are, there's a benefit there in the high quality of jobs and the fact that we are making great strides in that. There is a burden that they need services as well, and expensive services. Um, and so part of what we have looked at is the idea of impact fees or what uh, the city of Boston has done is they have pilot agreements with their nonprofits. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know that uh, Mayor Jennings here uh, has a pilot agreement and he's anxious to continue it. Uh, those are some of the things that we look at in terms of Syracuse in particular. The, um, the ratio of profit and nonprofit differs depending on your cities. Um, but the legal restrictions that New York State has put into place make it a very tough uphill climb for us to put something in place like that. So that is somewhere where the state could be helpful. And do you have other suggestions for how we could redesign state and local tax policy that you think would get to a more of an equitable distribution of resources to cities like your own? And I know Yonkers was here testifying in Rochester. Mayor Richards, I don't you know, he's not here, but he recommended potentially looking more at sales tax. I always have my concern that sales tax is most regressive the poorer you are. So, and he talked about his city's very high poverty rate. So the concern of shifting more and more of a tax burden to a sales tax, I think opens up some other questions. He talked about uh, the problems with property tax and you've just reiterated that. Do you, ha do you see another model that we should all be looking at? I think that we can all find that model together or get to that model together. And I know that I, I for one, and I know I can speak to the fact that we as mayors would like to meet with you and talk about those models. Uh, one of the issues with sales tax also is it's extremely volatile. Mm -hmm. um, so it makes it hard to budget or make projections based on what your sales tax is going to be. And, and I should also say in terms of what we have done as a city, uh, the county executive and I uh, negotiated a sales tax agreement that was approved by the state and um, we had help with our state from our state delegation that put into place what I believed was a more fair and equitable sales tax sharing agreement that recognized the importance of the city of Syracuse. And I, that's a very um, wonkish way to say they gave us more money. So <laughs> we're, uh, we're pleased with that. But 
whether it's looking at nonprofits and understanding that perhaps it's time to think about as a nonprofit, if you require fire department services, police services, Department of Public Work Services, you should pay. Um, or whether it's looking at is there another model where you can have a more unified base, as um, Mayor Richards talked about, spreading the base. But I also think on the other side of looking at the costs. So when you look at the drivers of what um, is costing us, whether it's um, binding interest arbitration, uh, whether it's uh, uh, you know, triborough, other issues, all of those things I think can be examined and so that we can, if we make a little bit of progress on each one of those, we will end up making a whole bunch of progress for our cities. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. I don't know if I have a question, but I'll make a comment and then see what comes into my mind, uh, if anything. Uh, first of all, it's been mentioned a couple of times about the bipartisan nature of uh, Onondaga County, and we have a perfect example with Stephanie Miner, Joni Mahoney's next, our county executive. Bill and I actually talk to each other and work together, and it's been very beneficial in this bipartisan uh, work that we do, I think, is showing in what's going on in Central New York. Secondly, uh, just a comment about the, uh, the pensions. Uh, I've, I've been here so long that I can remember things that were happening. Back in 2000, if I'm not mistaken, or thereabouts, there was a gubernatorial race, and uh, Governor Pataki's opponent was Carl McCall. And what his key campaign issue was cost of living increase for the, penalty, uh, for the uh, pensions. And I had many, many people coming in to me look, looking at me like I had three eyes when I said, you know, uh, you got to think about the future. And they said, well, look, the pension fund, the market's going crazy. The, uh, there's so much money in there you can afford it. I said, well, do you understand that sometimes markets go down? Well, because of the political issue, and it went away when the governor agreed to that uh, particular uh, proposal, and that was a source of some of the problems. Having been on the city side of things, I remember when we were in the days of milk and honey uh, that there were very little and sometimes no pension contributions were required because the market was flying high. And a lot of localities didn't set aside dollars to take care of the potential future downfall of the markets. So I think, I guess my point is everybody has part of the fault in this whole thing from all sides. But the issue is how do we resolve it? Getting to the governor's proposal. You may or may not have been in the room and I asked the mayor some questions about it. He, he's interpreting uh, what he said in a very diplomatic way. It sounded like that's not something he would do, postponing things in the future. Uh, and, uh, Bill Magnarelli mentioned, uh, you know, how come, you know, why, why are you against this thing? Well, if you ask most homeowners and tell them that on your 20-year mortgage, we'll allow you to pay maybe 10% less, but you got to pay for 30 years, they probably understand this better than anybody, that that's maybe not a trade-off you really want to worry about, because you're the one who's got to pay for it. Not today, but in the future as well. So I don't know what I meant, but I wanted to say all that. And, uh, and I think that you're prudent and everyone's prudent in trying to look through all of these proposals and come out, the, come out with a, a, a wise decision rather than making a political decision, which like some political decisions hurt us that we've made in the past. So with that said, uh, thank you. And uh, in five years, you may not be mayor, but you might get into the entertainment industry because I I, I was there when you were performing uh, with some other people uh, at, at a particular party, and you got a long, long career in that area as well. So, I, I thank hopeful, you. Hopefully, Senator, that won't be one of the highlights. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. If I may just respond to your, your comments um, in sort of reverse order that you made them, you're, you're absolutely right that if you gave a homeowner, you said, we'll give you 10 years, but it may end up to be 30 most people would recognize that is not a trade-off that I want to make. But to use your metaphor, if you said to that homeowner, you're not going to have any bathrooms, kitchens, or a roof unless you take this, that's where the cities are right now. 
um, and what uh, all of us are asking you to help join us to solve that problem. So we don't have to make this Hobson's choice. Um, or if in fact it ends up being a risk that is deemed appropriate to make, you will all understand that that's not the end of the discussion in terms of the financial challenges that face cities. Uh, and in terms of the stock market going up and going down, I think all of us have lived through and I we are all hopeful and believe that we are uh, slowly climbing ourselves out of an economic recession that was in large part started by a housing crisis where people said, I'm going to buy my house for $100,000 and in three years I'm going to save it for sell it for $300,000 and I'm going to get an interest only mortgage and I'll make that money with the balloon payment. So perhaps all of us uh, are the beneficiaries of going through that experience of uh, having people make assumptions about financial conditions that didn't come to pass and seeing the kind of wreckage families and homes um, in our country. Uh, and finally, in terms of the bipartisanship, I, I do want to say that I uh, appreciate your service and Assemblyman Magnarelli's service um, and my friend, the county executive, who's going to follow me. And I will, it gets, uh, because of my particular positions, uh, it gets brought up to me a lot. And I will answer it and say that when you're a mayor or you're in local government, you are a problem solver. And problems uh, come in all sorts of different ways and there is not any one solution that one party has or uh, the other party does not have. There are principles that I think when it comes time we talk about those principles about how we make govern, uh, governing decisions that differ. But we, what I have been fortunate enough to have in central New York in particular uh, and in Syracuse is that a group of people who want to solve problems and make the people who live in the entire community lives better um, and not just defer those, uh, those answers. So thank you all very much for your service um, and your generosity towards me and most importantly, all of the good work that you do for the people of the city of Syracuse. Thank you. Uh, 